All right, let's jump in with both feet. Sorry about that uh, departure from the topic. Now, uh, I, I know if you listen Monday, and that show, for some reason, I had a glitch, so the show wasn't safe. But, if you were listening Monday, you'll know that I promised to talk about the world at war and all the major conflicts going on. And since Hillary is basically being coronated, crowned queen of the world, we know that all of these major conflicts are going to intensify because she's a major warmonger. In fact, uh, her opponent, her trumped up opponent for this trumped up election is the pedophile Donald Trump alleged pedophile. I know he's a very litigious man with very small hands, so anything I say about him is alleged until proven otherwise. But um, Trump, well, Trump has actually demonstrated himself to be less warmongering. He's more interested in suppressing the local population. He wants to close down U.S. society. He wants to close down the press. He wants to beat up protesters. But as far as people like Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-il, he figured that they should be able to, you know, run their regions and run their nations the way they see fit and that the U.S. should focus on keeping their rabble in check, you know, which is an elite agreement. And remember, it used to be in the 80s during the Cold War, the progressive liberal position was we have to reach out a hand to the Soviet Union. We have to talk to the Russians. We can't just uh, issue threats and, and maintain hostility. It was the progressive anti-war, anti-nuke position that we should talk to Moscow. And we should work with Moscow as partners in peace and reduction in nuclear arms. All through the 80s, really in the 50s, everybody was anti-Russian. And actually, the liberals, the progressives, were more anti-Russian than the uh, conservatives even. But as the Cold War began to thaw a little bit, but now the, the things have flipped. That's why I don't nothing mean nothing to nobody in this country politically. It's all about the money. There's no really no values, no culture, no standards in this society. You know. And if you really believe that, if you believe that Hillary's running for president out of some desire to make things better for the working class. If you believe Trump truly wants to make America great again, despite if, if they're delusional or not, then you are a sap sucker, lily lever, yellow belly sucker, man, I swear. You know, and I had to go way back decades to get them insults, because they ain't even no modern insults for you. you. You the kind of fool that they don't even make nowadays. Them the kind of fools they made back before there was even television or radio. You a fool. It's all about the money. So now it's flipped. Now the, the progressive position, the Obama position, the democratic position, the liberal position is we're going to be hard on the Russians. And now the, the, the right wing fascist position is we're going to talk to the Russians. We're going to respect Russia. We're going to respect Russian sovereignty. When back in the 80s when Reagan, it was flipped. And, in the same, and now we have some of our uncles and aunties that were democratic under Carter, who supported Mondale, who were democratic in the 80s, were, were the same people that were supporting, yes, we have to talk to the Russians, we need nuclear treaties and negotiations and arms uh, armistices against the Russians, are now voting for Hillary, who says, I'm going to bring down the hammer, no fly zones, sanctions, which is an act, a direct and deliberate act of war. So y'all some suckers. Because they, they just flip on you. Democrats are now the Republicans. The Republicans are now the Democrats. And we don't even have the sense of our sharecropping, run over boots, overall wearing ancestors to know that if nothing else in this political system, you don't get emotionally invested. You vote your interest. And if it's in your best interest to jump ship from the one party to the next and you do it, or to abandon both parties, then that's what you do. So that's what they did. Remember, most black folks were Republican, turn of the century, when we finally did get the right to vote 100 years after we had the right to revolt still. And then 
slowly but surely and deliberately and intelligently, we said, you know, ain't nothing over here for us. The Democrats is handed out sweeter candy. So we went over there to get our cut. And now it's time for us to have a political powwow amongst ourselves and figure out, you know, what's our next move for the black voting bloc. And not be emotional, I ain't voting, like the black nationalists, or be emotional like the integrationists. Voting is what our ancestors died for. No, our ancestors didn't die for us to vote, and no, voting is not completely meaningless. There's some nuance, some balance, and some, some better, more thorough analysis needed there. And that's not even what I want to talk about. I did promise to talk about the global conflicts because Hillary is a war monk. Hillary is, if you want to know what a Hillary presidency looks like, a feminist presidency looks like, a matriarchal presidency looks like, go to DuckDuckGo, the search engine that doesn't track you. Or you can go to Google if you want to flood the NSA with all this senseless data. Because I say, just blow up their servers. Just flood them with everything. They want to watch, give them something to watch. Too much that they can't even process all the data. Or you can go to DuckDuckGo if you're on some other stuff and you don't feel like being watched at the moment. And Google go to my ear or Margaret Thatcher or Queen Victoria. If you think a little bit more estrogen in the white power pop pop, uh, pipeline in the veins of the white power beast is going to make any difference for the world. It didn't make any more because like Obama put a little Afro sheen in, in the pipeline of white power and it didn't change nothing. Oh, it put us to sleep. So are middle-aged white women going to go to sleep, stop being so hostile and protest things that since one of theirs is at the helm, it's all gravy? Are they just going to share beautiful images of Hillary in her pantsuit? cradling her grandchild and be like, oh, Hillary on fleek. Like black folks were sharing pictures of uh, Obama looking all sharp in his Ray-Ban sunglasses. Or they're going to show pictures of uh, Bill Clinton as he, you know, prematurely ages, sitting on a beach in a Speedo and be like, ooh, first, the first husband is fine. Like black folks been sharing pictures of Michelle in her ball gowns or swim bathing suit, talking about how beautiful and shapely she is. Are, are, are middle-aged white women going to go and sip the Hillary Kool-Aid? Are they going to take that token of a middle-aged grandmother? Oh, she's beyond middle-aged, but an elderly grandmother in office doing the work of the empire. Are they going to fall for the okey-doke like the black masses across the globe fell for the okey-doke of a black presidency? Oh, and one more thing. Because then I'll get into it. Because what I really wanted to talk about, I was going to talk about War of the Worlds. We're going to have to say that for Friday because, you know, the police didn't apologize. The, the, International, the Poli- International Association of Police Captains that issued us an apology. An apology. So we'll come back to that. So what I really, and one more thing, because the debate is tomorrow. And what I'm going to do, because I want to do a debate special. We, we got to keep chopping it up about politics. Politics, many ticks. Many bloodsuckers. We have to chop it up. I'm going to take the questions and issues that are posed to the two candidates, the real candidate and, and, and the Trump card in the candidacy. I'm going to take it and then address them from a pan-African perspective tomorrow. I haven't watched any debates. I, I prefer to read the transcripts afterwards. I just can't look at those people. They're, not just, they're just not the most attractive people. Hey, it's not even anything political or ideological. It's just my own personal taste. Trump looks like a clown, and I giggle a little every time I see him. He's a funny-looking dude. Like, if you saw him walking down the street, you know, and it's a funny-looking dude. And Hillary is just bland. Blah! You know, but you ain't, I mean, whatever. But I'll take that. But what I do want to say is, guess who Trump is kicking it with? And he's going to bring him to the election. It's Malik Obama. Yes, Barack Obama's half-brother. And so now everybody tune in. I just want to talk to Barack Obama's half-brother for a second. I know what it's like. Listen, I had an older brother who was a baller. You know, while I was a little lame, going, humping off to school, didn't really have no respect in my little projects. Didn't have no name. My name wasn't ringing out. I was catching the bus and barely had enough money for that. 
And that's when the bus was only 75 cents. I had a brother who was ball and leather jackets and, and all the hip stuff, fly shoes, had this nice little tricked out cars, and he even had like the, the custom made little door lock knobs, rims, he was balling out. And nobody paid any attention to me. And every now and then he'd throw me a bone, he'd come get me, swoop me and maybe one of my friends up, take us to the club, take us to the mall, kick it a little bit, then drop me right back off in my little dismal existence as he continued to ball out of control. Shout out, Thunder. All right, now he's calmed down. He's an older man now. He's tending to his job, tending to his job. But he used to ball out, and I was a nobody. But you know what? I never. I was always loyal. Couldn't say nothing to me about my older brother, my half-brother. Couldn't tell me nothing. That's my brother from a different mother, and we ride or die. But you got to stay loyal just for your own sake, even if your brother... It's a petty token fascist. So you're going to side with a real, blatant, open fascist? So Malik, don't do this, man. Don't show up at the debate. Don't let Trump play you like that. Because after the election, guess what? He's going to kick you right back to Kenya. He's going to deport you with all the Mexicans. You might end up in Mexico. He might not even spring for a ticket all the way to Kenya. Don't play yourself, man. Don't play yourself. Stay loyal to your brother because he's your brother. And, and yeah, you go to him and you check him. There's nothing wrong with you stepping to him. Like, yo, I don't like what you're doing. So I'm about to ruin. You know, whatever. But don't, 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 don't show up on national, global TV, really, sitting on Trump's lap. Don't do that, Malik Obama. But now I want to talk to Trump. Everybody tune out. That's enough for now, Trump. <laughs> I just want to say to you, you, you wild. You're a wild dude, Trump. You funny. You real funny to go get dude's brother like that. You funny. I mean, that's just, a, a, you just, I mean, as we sit in the concentration camps, if you are elected, we'll be some of the most well entertained victims of mass genocide there's ever been in it. Cause you a funny dude. That's all I gotta say. Get back on TV, get off of this political stuff and go clown around the television screen on reality TV. I mean, you look how many Vaginas are going ungrabbed as you pretend to be something other than a sexually assaulting fascist. Get off, get off this politics stuff. You can't really shine or glow. What, I don't think you shine. Trump, you glow. Glow orange, orange dust. You know, get off of that. Don't let them trick you into trying to join that bland, tired circle. Anyway, that's my advice. I don't really have any advice for Hillary because you know you got it in the bag. And you've been... Yeah, and messing with Hillary, she might put me up, because I don't know what kind of trans Hillary got black folks under. But she ain't going to get me. You know, I'm going to erect my shrine, burn my candles, and sacrifice my rubber chicken, because I don't want no Hillary Juju on me. Ancestors be with me. Protect me, because this woman got some magical powers. We need to re bring back the Salem witch trial, because to, to, to be a blatantly, openly racist, Blatantly, openly mass incarceration. Blatantly, openly subversion of African sovereignty from Haiti to Africa to Somalia. You know, and still have the abundance of black folks voting for you. I, I've been down for black folks all my life and I ain't got nowhere near the love from black folks you got. And can't nobody show where I've subverted my people. At least not documented. <laughs> so I don't know, Hillary. You scare me. Maybe that's it. My own man in security. Oh, I got to take. And this, listen, for y'all watching me live, I know I come in, I have on a sweater or a jacket, and I take it off. It's because when I walk in here, they be blasting the AC, and I turn off the AC. And then, you know, it takes a while to warm up, and then it gets a little too hot, but I prefer it a little too hot than a little too cold. So this is not like a show for y'all on live. This is not some James Brown pre-planned performance type thing. This is just me, you know trying to adjust and work in unnatural climate. Now, but to my topic at hand, what is some other stuff? There's another thing I wanted to talk about before I get to my topic. And then I just always kick stuff down the road. Y'all remember uh, Jessica Lynn Sanders? She was the woman who went viral here in Chicago because she spit on a black couple and uh, called them the N-word. Y'all remember that? 
And, uh, well, they played this on the media, so I guess it's safe for radio. What's your call? Let's say it again. Wait, where, where's the... Racism at Chicago Margarita Festival, July 30th, 2016. And she's slapping up her brother. I wonder if her famous... The racism heard around the world. Now y'all didn't heard what they said. What 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 uh Becky with the mess hair said. Jessica Lynn Sanders. And and I and forget about Jessica Lynn Sanders. Why isn't this brother submitted to the Vatican for sainthood? We have a saint in our midst. We have I mean that brother is the second coming of Christ. Because I don't know a black man, I don't think Uncle Tom, Uncle Clarence Thomas, I don't think the, the reserved Barack Hussein Obama and Michelle Obama could have been subjected to that. And just, I, I, we have a holy man in our midst. I'm going to go on a pilgrimage to find the brother who take this and sit at his feet and see what wisdom he can impart to me. Because obviously this brother has reached nirvana. This brother is a guru. He's a saint. He's a llama. I mean, this brother is the peak holy man of all of the religions, if you ask me, because I mean, just I'm almost I almost swung on the damn computer screen. <laughs> I almost put my foot through the damn computer screen. Just watching it. But he was there and his wife got spit on and his wife, I guess. But, you know, religions don't mess with women too heavy. She should just be happy because, you know, all of, even even the Buddhism and the Hinduism, all sexist and anti-women. So she just has to be content with, you know, she could get sainthood. She can't get no, oh, she can't like get no major titles. And she gonna have to be dead for a while. But this brother and his wife are just some of the most, wow. Civil and patient and mindful. And I hope they get some money, I don't know. Jessica Lynn, I mean, she don't look like she got most. But I hope they take her trailer they take her mess cook lab. They take her smelly little tank top and yoga pants and all of her Ugg boots. Take it all. You know, takes her, take her Paps Blue Ribbon, her last case of Paps. You sue her for everything she's got. Those scrungies and those Starbucks gift cards and that case of Nutella. Take everything that girl got, man. And I know it ain't much. I mean, just distribute it to other working class and poor white people. Even because I know we don't have much use for them type of things, but don't let her keep him and get her. But here's my issue. I didn't even want to talk, talk about that because normally I don't, I don't get I, I like to deal with bigger issues. But here's my because here's the bigger issues. Here's what we're missing on this issue. Um, she's been charged with a hate crime. And I don't know if you understand hate crimes legislation, but when you're charged with a hate crime, it's bigger because, you know, just. Felony assault is bad enough, but when they put in hate or racial crime, they stamp, they make it a fed case, that means you got to do extra time, more time, it marks you for life. And black folks, at least that I've seen since the charges were announced and her $50,000 bail, which she hasn't made yet, was announced. Um, <clears throat> we've been hooping and hollering as if justice has been done. And let me tell y'all something. Who you think is going to be up next for hate crimes? They just charged a black woman, a Black Lives Matter activist with felony lynching, you know. And not only that, look up the genocide laws, because when they put laws against genocide, right? When they made the, the genocide law, black folks were like, yes, as if we really thought, because we've been victims of sustained ongoing genocide since 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But even before then, there's been campaigns 
of white aggression, Western aggression, Asian aggression, Arab aggression, Islamic aggression, genocidal aggression against African people, against native people, against aboriginal people, New Zealand. So when the UN says, hey, we're going, we had, they had the Nuremberg trials and they had the convention on genocide, they defined what the crime of genocide is and said, okay, anybody else doing genocide, you're going to be brought before the world, convicted and locked up in the Hague, world court, right? But let's look at the list of people who've been charged and convicted of genocide. Uh, Argentine, there was an Argentinian uh, strong man. Bosnia, of course. But they, you know, Bosnians, remember the Mongol hordes. There's this thing. We're going to get into white ethnicity. Because I know we think of white like a blanket of snow, like a, a avalanche of snow, perhaps. But there's a lot of distinctions within that, that diverse. I mean, there's a lot of white diversity. A lot of, <laughs> I don't know, I, I can't even say that without laughing. But we're going to get into the di ethnic internal divisions of white folks. Because somebody asked me to do, because I had promised to do a show on the myth of white unity. Because you know these clowns out here, black people don't stick together. As if anybody else sticks together. That's not our issue, that the fact that we don't stick together. That's not our issue. Right? Okay, you had one Argentinian convicted of genocide. You had one Bosnian convicted of genocide. One Ecuadorian convicted of genocide. Two Ethiopians convicted of genocide. One, three Iraqis convicted of genocide. One Italian convicted of genocide. 26 Rwandans, Africans. 26 Africans convicted of genocide and one Serbian. And like I said, Bosnian and Serbians, I know y'all thinking, them is white folks. And maybe even some of y'all Argentine, but them are not, no, them is dingy white folks. Them are Slavs. And, and even Hitler, all the Aryan white nationalists know the Slavic people, especially since their flirtation with communism. But even long before then, they ain't never really been down with the West. That's Central and Eastern Europe and even Southern Europe. It's a pretty tight circle of official, full-on whiteness. Fin Finnish, Scottish, British, maybe Irish sometimes. You know, they have a, a temporary, they're under pro, they're, they're, their ticket to whiteness is under probation. It stays under probation. But anyway, the vast majority, Ethiopians, Arabs, Africans and Arabs, or Africans and Persians, depending, Totally dominate. And we thought that genocide was supposed to, and these are people who have been victims of genocide. So, and then as we look at the history, as hate crimes legislation pro progresses, I predict that black nationalists, black liberation fighters, black people standing up to white aggressions will be the new face of hate crimes. But they do need their scapegoats. They do need their sacrificial lambs. Because this woman obviously committed criminal and felony assault. And she obviously needs to be charged and convicted. But when they throw that hate crime on there and they make it public, this is their altar. They're throwing her. She is the virginal sacrifice because they about to bring all that hate crimes, racial crimes. So if you get in fight with a white dude and there's any type of racial element to it. So in the fit of rage, you swinging on this dude and you might use the word you might call him a saltine or a Ritz, all of a sudden you, instead of just getting into a fight, something that could have been, you know, played down to a public disturbance and, you know, you play a small fine, you end up in the Fed doing 10 to 15 as a hate criminal. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you show up and protest a, 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 a Klan rally and it gets heated and they say you came there to spark racial tensions, race riots. So I'm just saying, you know, watch this hate crime stuff. Now, I'm not about to march. I'm not about to get a Becky with the mess face uh, t-shirt. I'm not about to contribute to her GoFundMe. I'm just saying, we got to look at our own interests and we got to look at the long game. Don't, don't need your reactionary. So I think that's the, 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 the stuff that popped up in my face. Maybe I can get back to the issues at hand now. I'm sorry, y'all. Terrence Cunningham. When you hear that name, don't you think of a black dude? Terrence Cunningham. 
When I first read this, I had to run to the worldwide internet to look it up, because I'm like, this is a brother. But no, so, I mean, because, you know, Terrence, that's our name. We took that. Or they gave it to us. Either one, that's our, that, but Terrence belongs to us. Every dude I know named Terrence has been a black dude. My best friend, my absolute best friend since third grade, name was Terrence. But of course, he changed his name to Rip T. Fresh when we decided to be rappers. And then he shortened it to Rip T and then just Rip. And then T, you know how the evolution of nicknames in the hood, we all know it. We all study it. But his, his, his mama named him Terrence. And Cunningham, okay, it's not Jefferson. It's not Jackson. It's not Washington. But I mean, I know some black Cunninghams. And it's not the most common. I just thought, but again, that's not relevant at all. I thought it was a brother when I first read it and based on what he said. But Terrence Cunningham is the president of this relatively obscure group group called the uh, International Association of Ch Chief of Police. They, they need better marketing. And this dude apologized. I apologize. Uh, tell me what to do. He said he was sorry for the historical treatment of police. The historical treatment uh, uh, or historical abuse. No, he said he was sorry for the historical abuse that black people have suffered and the role that the police have played in that historical abuse. And everybody was like, whoa, this is major. Not really. But everybody lost their feces. Everybody evacuated their bowels immediately because this is this international... Because I've heard of the fraternal order of police and the police unions and all that, but I've never really heard of the International Association of Police Chiefs. And I'm assuming, well, you got police chiefs from all over the world, and maybe that's what provoked this apology. First, he acknowledged that police have participated, I mean, yeah, okay, Captain Obvious, Chief Obvious, that police have played a role in the historical abuses, but then he, he this is a part they didn't report on. He basically said that was then and this is now. And he said that that is no longer the case. Look it up. Look up the details of the statement. They just play the one part. And so I decide, I ain't never heard of no internal association of police chiefs. And why now? Why today? Why didn't they do it after Rodney King was beat on in front of the world? Why didn't they do it, you know, when, when, when uh, Bull O'Connor? Because they've been around a while. When Bull O'Connor was spraying us with water hoses and sicking dogs on us. Why today? Of all days. And this is something we have to remember about the United States. They don't do nothing for us. Unless it benefits them first and foremost. And we, rem and we never acknowledge the role that the evil empire, the evil Soviet Union played in helping black folks in the United States secure civil rights. Again, you can go to the non-tracking search engine of DuckDuckGo or Google and look up Soviet Civil War propaganda. The, war, the U.S. media is not the first media outlet that broadcasts the racial abuses of African people and protesters across the world. It was the Soviet Union, and the U.S. media had to play catch-up. But we're at the top of the hour. You're listening to Q4 Radio, AM 1680, broadcasting straight out of Chicago. A skinny host named Diallo. That's all. Close. I can get two line raps. That's it. Um, so I'm going to take a break. Musical interlude. And I'm going to get into this. And I'm going to share the policy platform and mission of the International Association of Police. Because what I'm calling this show is winning peace to wage oppression. Because uh, Dale Jones said that, that our oppressors do this thing called loosening up to get a tighter grip. This is psychological warfare. This is the uh, textbook art of warfare. You feign peace in order to come back with a more aggressive attack. So black people are all in a tizzy. The world is watching. So hey, we're going to lighten up on the colored folks. See? See how nice we're being? They're holding you in a tight headlock, but at the same time, they're stroking your head. You know? So we're going to come back and get into that. I'm going to break down. I'm going to talk about their legislation. Because they got a, a huge legislative program. And you won't believe it's an insult. At this point, based on what I knew, I thought it was just some tokenism, some PR, but it's worse than that. It's much more insidious than that, this apology. And then the Black Lives Matter leaders are split. Some are saying it's not enough. Some are saying they, they applaud. But I'm saying it's all bunk. 
You can take your apology and shove it up your black sounding name behind Terrence. And I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this. I'm not just hating for hating. Yes, I'm a cynic. Yes, I'm critical. But I'm going to give you specifics as to why we should reject as a community the International Association of Police Chiefs formal and public apology for historical abuses and the role that the police played in those abuses. So when I come back from this musical break, and y'all don't really dig this musical break. I think I got some real some hot fire for y'all. But anyway, when we come back, we'll get deeper into that. This is Coco T. Nardo Rakes, Rikers Island. Now this one is a special dedication to all the men living in Rikers Island. Coco T. and Nardo Rankin, man. Me, 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 and me, me, like. Um, see, I'm, I'm not pointing. Peace. Um, thanks for tuning in live. I'm going off live, but you can find me at q4.org, the website. Uh, you can go to the Q4 Radio Facebook page and listen directly from there. Or you can find the show archived sooner than later at DialoCanyada.com. Thanks for tuning in live. And uh, please continue to tune in. Please continue to get my numbers up so I can stay here because I like it here. You know, very comfortable. Cushy seats. They're old. They're grimy, but they're cushy too. Peace.